for now. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about risk and vulnerability for mood disorders in teens. And if any of you um, either have a teenager at home or are a teenager, um, you um, may find this topic of interest. So the first, um, before I begin, um, I just want to thank the International Bipolar Foundation for putting on um, this webinar and for providing these kinds of educational seminars, I think is really, really important. And so please donate. Uh, this is the a link to the website. And I just want to thank you for supporting uh, the foundation. Uh, I have no uh, financial disclosures to report. And just to give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today, um, the, we're going to start with talking about this concept of brain plasticity and how that relates to vulnerability, and particularly vulnerability to mood disorder in adolescence. Um, and sleep and circadian changes are one of the factors that uh, are, are really a critical change that occurs during the adolescent period, so shifts in uh, circadian rhythms. And then at the end, I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about a, a new project um, that we have going on um, in Latin America in which we're looking at some genetic and environmental risk factors for the development of mood disorder. Um, and then, um, as Debbie mentioned, at, at the end, I will talk about some potential interventions uh, related to lifestyle changes um, that can, can help with some of these things. So the teenage brain, uh, this is a picture that I really love from, uh, I think it's from a cover of Newsweek a few years ago. The teenage brain is something we're really just beginning to appreciate in terms of the degree of extensive re remodeling and rewiring of the brain that, that really goes on during this adolescent period. And so we've known for many years that there is this period of incredible plasticity that occurs in infancy where you have this um, increased development of language and attention and um, functions like that. And in recent years, uh, it's become really clear that there's a similar period of uh, increased brain plasticity that happens in adolescence, um, this increasing structural reorganization that really is related to a lot of the changes in our ability to self-regulate that occur during this time period. So what are some of these structural changes that occur in the brain? Well, um, as I mentioned, we view this as a time of both incredible potential as well as um, incredible vulnerability. So what we know is happening uh, during adolescent neurodevelopment, there are changes in the gray matter of our brain. These are the, the neurons, or, or uh, what we consider our brain cells. Um, and so during typical development, synapses, so those connections between uh, neurons, are overproduced early in development. But then during adolescence, uh, what's called synaptic pruning, this process eliminates about 40% of our cortical synapses. So basically, our brain is becoming more efficient um, as, as these uh, exuberant connections are pruned down. There are also changes in the white matter of the brain. And uh, the figure on the right is just showing you these are the, what the white matter fiber tracks look like in the brain. And so there are uh, changes that occur as part of typical development in uh, the hippocampus, uh, which is important for memory, and then the frontal lobe, which is, of course, important for things like cognitive control. And uh, these brain structures undergo the majority of myelination or increasing um, connectivity of these white matter tracks into adolescence, and that continues through adulthood. Um, so during adolescence, while you have this uh, gray matter decrease due to synaptic pruning, there's a concomitant increase in, in white matter volume uh, related to this myelination. So really you can think of the white matter in your brain as like the internet, so it's really increasing efficiency. And so we think that much of the potential and many of the vulnerabilities of the brain may really depend on what happens in these first two decades of life. So the first brain areas to mature are those with the most basic functions, um, so, such as things, uh, you know, functions involved in processing senses and movement, and areas involved in um, spatial orientation and language, um, for example, in the parietal lobes um, and temporal lobes, are uh, follow. So in the, around uh, the ages of 7 to 15, we see an incredible growth spurt in these regions of the brain. Um, and then areas uh, with more advanced functions, they basically are involved in higher order integration. Uh, this is the prefrontal cortex. And so as you can see in the picture, that uh, part of the brain really undergoes its uh, maturation between the ages of 16 to 20. Um, so it's really a late maturing structure. 
And in some ways, we can think of adolescence as a health paradox um, because uh, it's a time if we have these extensive increases in our physical and mental capabilities, and yet uh, overall mortality and morbidity rates increase significantly from childhood and to adolescence. And this is often due to preventable causes, um, such as, as risk-taking behavior, um, increased uh, number of car accidents, drug abuse, and so forth. And so we think that uh, there's basically an asynchrony in the developmental time courses between our effective approach systems and cognitive control brain systems. So that top-down monitoring of our interest in risk-taking behavior and so forth. And we think that um, that, that sort of asynchrony may lead to uh, an increased vulnerability for risk-taking during adolescence. Um, so this, uh, this prefrontal cortical maturation that I showed you on the previous slide um, in, in both the dorsolaterals, that's sort of the top part of the frontal lobes, as well as the orbitofrontal region, which is um, the part that lies underneath, uh, this is really assumed to correspond to the development of higher level cognitive processes during this time period. And um, the maturation of our subcortical brain systems like uh, structures like the nucleus accumbens, are particularly activated um, relative to these top-down control systems in adolescence. And I'm just going to show you um, uh, some, some data from a functional neuroimaging study. Uh, this is a, a paradigm. So in functional neuroimaging, we're basically looking at uh, activity, what the brain does. So we're looking at neural activity in the brain when you're responding to a particular task paradigm. And so this is a study done by my colleague, Adriana Galban, at UCLA, which uh, parametrically manipulates reward values. And so if you can see on the top, there's this little pirate guy up here um, who has, a, there's a low reward, one coin, then you can get a medium reward. And you can see if, the, if you get this cue with the pirate, it signals a medium reward. If you get this cue with the pirate, it signals you get a, a big reward. And so um, the, the cues were, were each paired with a distinct reward value, in other words. And this remained constant throughout the experiment. So what, as you're doing the experiment, you kind of get used to, you see this cue, and you start thinking, okay, I'm probably going to get this low reward. And so this task was given to adolescents and, what they, and, and to adults and, um, and to younger children. And what they found was actually really interesting. So um, you can see that in this nucleus accumbens, this is the brain structure that's really critical in responding to reward. So in the nucleus accumbens, there was increasing uh, activity as, as the reward got bigger. So the bigger the stack of coins, the bigger, the more your nucleus accumbens lights up. And then similarly, um, similarly, in uh, the lateral orbital frontal cortex, which is involved in reward decision making, um, you see more activity um, in the brain with a larger reward. But what's interesting was that there was a really different pattern um, between the adolescents and the adults and, and children. So, so in other words, with the orbital frontal cortex, this is involved in sort of regulation of emotional behavior, we actually see more activation in the kids, whereas this reward center of the brain is looking similar in um, adolescents and, and, I'm sorry, in children and adults, but it's doing something really different in adolescents. You get a lot more reward-related uh, activity. And so we think that this sort of asynchrony of these frontal and subcortical regions um, may relate to this, this pattern of increased impulsivity and increased uh, risk-taking behavior that we see during adolescence. So this study was just a nice example of that. So this may also, we think, be related to increased mood lability and risk for mood disorders that occurs during this time period. And so uh, this is um, from the CDC, um, looking at mood disorder prevalence for children. Um, overall, it's about 3.7%. But what you can see is that um, this rate almost, I mean, it, it almost doubles um, between the ages of 8 to 11 and 12 to 15. So something is really going on. And it's probably related to um, changes uh, related to puberty. There's also a shift in the gender distribution, whereas uh, uh, the uh, females really increase in early childhood. Males and females have a similar uh, prevalence of, of depression or mood disorder, whereas in adolescence that really shifts and females are at much higher risk. And um, again, this is just showing um, in breaking down the ages in, in more detail. 
um, again, you can see much higher risk for, um, for females. And then when you look at uh, between the ages of 13 to 18, what happens, that risk for mood disorder goes up to almost 20%, so almost one in five. So this is a very common disorder, and you can really think of the adolescent period in itself as a risk factor for developing a mood disorder. So what are some other key changes that occur during adolescence? Well, sleep patterns are a big one. Um, we know that, that newborns sleep about um, 16 to 18 hours a day. Um, that goes down to about 11 hours by age five. Um, and in adolescence, our nighttime sleep reduces from about nine hours at age 13 to less than eight hours at age 16. And that's, of course, on average. There's a lot of variability. There's also um, circadian changes that occur in adolescence. So there is a delay in uh, our circadian phase and sleep onset and often shifts past midnight. So um, if you have a teenager at home, you may notice they, um, you know, become shifted to becoming a night owl and, and sleeping later in the morning. And so that is related to hormonal changes that occur um, in adolescence. And there is, um, at the same time, there's an increased biological need for sleep that's associated with pubertal development. Nevertheless, adolescents are, are usually getting less sleep. And so this is something that's um, really been, uh, people have paid some attention to in the public health area, um, this, this inadequate sleep, um, you know, so-called epidemic in adolescents. And so if you look here, um, the number of adolescents who are getting um, what's considered insufficient or less than seven hours of sleep a night is, um, it's a really high percentage. It's the majority. So it's almost 69%. And um, borderline, so then about a quarter of adolescents get eight hours of sleep, which is considered borderline. Greater Nine or more hours is considered optimal, and that is a small minority um, of adolescents. And we know that poor sleep is associated with poor academic performance um, for adolescents from middle school through college. Um, insufficient sleep is also associated with higher um, rates of substance use risky behavior, as well as mood um, disturbance and sadness and suicidal ideation. So these are really consistent associations. Um, here we have Grumpy Cat. Um, <laughs> sometimes I feel like this, the worst thing after waking up, everything until I go to bed again, um, you know, until I have some coffee. Um, we know that eveningness is a, a, a risk factor for sleep dysregulation. So eveningness is really being um, this idea of being a, a, a night owl. And, um, and this is really a natural um, pattern of, of sleep behavior, but there is a variability in this. And so some people are larks and some people are, are night owls. Um, and so this is a very, very large study of um, over 6,000 adolescents. And in this study, they found that eveningness, so, um, you know, staying up, basically being shifted over where you go to sleep late and wake up late, um, was associated with more daytime sleepiness, attention problems, poor school achievement, as well as more injuries, um, more emotional upset, and more sleep disturbance. And so part of this, we really think, is a mismatch between one's natural, uh, you know, daily rhythm and the, you know, societal constraints in terms of kids have to wake up early to go to school. And um, that obviously creates some, some difficulties for people that are naturally on a late-running rhythm. Um, there was a sleep habit survey administered to over 3,000 high school students, uh, which found that students um, who slept for less than six hours and 45 minutes um, on school nights or had a more than two-hour weekend bedtime delay, so they, they, you know, would go to bed maybe at 10 on a school night, but not till midnight on, on a weekend. Um, so basically a very, very variable sleep pattern. Um, so those students also had increased daytime sleepiness, more depressed mood, and um, more sleep-wake behavior problems. And another, this was a study done by um, my colleague Andrew Fellini um, here at UCLA, and um, it turns out that it's not just chronic sleep deprivation, but also changes in daily sleep are related to daily variability in mood. And so this was a very nice study um, done using a daily diary method um, where they basically had um, adolescents rate their mood every day, um, and then they looked at the relationship between how much sleep um, they'd gotten the night before. And so um, let me just walk you through what this is showing. So this is showing the relationship um, between self-reported anxiety, depression, fatigue, and happiness, and um, the adolescents, um, uh, how much sleep they got the night before. And so you can see that um, there is a strong relationship here. These are all significant. Um, 
And it's not just between uh, if you have um, less sleep, you have more anxiety, more depression, more fatigue, and uh, lower ratings of, of happiness. So more sleep is associated with higher self-reported happiness. Um, the other thing that was important here was that it's not just uh, how much sleep you got, but sleep deviation. That means how much variability was there in your sleep pattern. And that was also uh, correlated with higher depression, anxiety, fatigue, and, um, and lower happiness. So in other words, it, like I said, it's not just how much sleep you get, but, but how, how, how changeable that is from day to day. So basically, the take-home message from this is being on a regular sleep schedule is actually really helpful for mood. Okay. So what controls our sleep-wake cycle in humans? Well, there's a lot of evidence that um, a sleep-wake cycle is disrupted uh, in, in mood disorders. So um, this cycle is regulated um, um, by a structure called the suprachiasmatic nucleus um, in the hypothalamus of the brain. And it's a homeostatic process. Um, so that means it's a, it's a feedback loop, essentially. And so it's determined by, by our amount of prior sleep and wakefulness. And this homeostatic mechanism really allows us to maintain wakefulness during the day and, and promote sleep at night. Now, turning now to the way sleep is disrupted in clinical mood disorders. Um, this is uh, this is Emil Kreiplin, who is a very famous uh, German psychiatrist who observed people with manic depressive illness or bipolar disorder um, in, in inpatient units and um, had some really interesting observations. And so um, Dr. Kreiplin uh, reported, uh, described this as uh, the attacks of manic depressive insanity are invariably accompanied by all kinds of bodily changes. By far the most striking are the disorders of sleep and general nourishment. In mania, sometimes there's almost complete sleeplessness and most interrupted for a few hours, which may last for weeks and even months. In the states of depression, in spite of great need for sleep, the patients lie for hours sleepless in bed, although even in bed they find no refreshment. So he was really noticing, I mean, um, this was back in the early 1900s, uh, just the, the prominence of uh, sleep dysregulation in uh, uh, people with bipolar disorder. Now, sleep is something that we may take for granted, but it actually serves an incredibly important biological function. Um, it's, uh, there were um, several cases uh, documented of fluoride mania, which um, were characterized by almost no sleep, that actually ended fatally um, with, with really severe sleep de deprivation. And that's the case in animal models of sleep deprivation also. Um, prolonged sleep deprivation will lead to death. Um, and uh, the uh, reliable syndrome results from sleep deprivation, which um, involves uh, skin lesions. This is in, in animal models again, skin lesions, weight loss, increased energy expenditure, um, and uh, changes in body temperature, um, some neurotransmitter changes, and ultimately death. So, so again, we, we really don't understand sleep very well, despite the fact that we spend a lot of a percentage of our lives sleeping, and uh, and we also we we just don't don't know a lot about it. Um, there are several lines of evidence, however, for a central role of, of sleep and circadian disturbance in bipolar disorder. Uh, we know that sleep disturbance is among the most um, prominent correlates of mood episodes, and, and also correlate of inadequate recovery. And um, impaired sleep can also can induce and also predict uh, manic episodes. And of course, diurnal mood variation is uh, an important uh, component for, for many people that have a mood disorder. There are also um, animal models uh, uh, using a, a knockout of a clock gene, which is a circadian gene. Um, and this mouse exhibited some manic-like behaviors, which were interestingly reversed with lithium treatment, of course, one of the first-line treatments for bipolar disorder. And this gene is known to also to be involved in regulation of dopamine activity. So looking at, at what we know about uh, the initial, uh, the prodrome or the pre-onset period of initial mania, sleep disturbance is really, if you look across these different studies, um, sleep disturbance or decreased need for sleep was reported across all of them. Um, and there were, of course, other symptoms as well. But this seems to be the common denominator here. Um, so basically, sleep um, disturbance may be a predictor for uh, the onset of, of an initial mood episode. Oops. Hi, sorry, my screen just um, crashed. Let me see if I can get it back up here.
clips. Uh, okay, there we go. So, okay, sorry, I'm just going to breeze back through. There we were. Okay. Um, so going back to this model of looking at sleep deprivation as a proximal cause for mania, um, and this was a hypothesis put forth by Ware, um, who hypothesized that sleep deprivation is really a fundamental proximal cause, in other words, a final um, common pathway of mania. And so, so essentially what we have here in this model is that you could have a primary sleep disorder or other causes, so um, some kind of event uh, like drug use, uh, withdrawal, some illness, leading to insomnia, or there could be environmental um, things that, that cause sleep disturbance, such as a separation, um, a loss. Also, emotional excitement um, doesn't necessarily have to be a, a negative that can lead to insomnia. But in other words, any of these events, um, also, also social events, um, life events that disrupt sleep schedules, having a newborn, for example, being a shift worker, um, late social activities, all of these things, um, it, you know, basically lead to sleep deprivation and sleep loss, uh, uh, where it believes to be a final um, common pathway um, leading, leading to uh, onset of mania or um, either initial mania or um, relapse and uh, for, for having an, another uh, manic episode. And this is, of course, not true for everybody, but for vulnerable individuals, these factors can certainly uh, precipitate uh, a mood episode. So um, in the last few minutes, I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about a project that we have going on now um, in Latin America. Um, so this is actually a really interesting population where um, these are Spanish explorers that came to the region in the early um, 16th and 17th century. Um, these uh, two regions are the Central Valley of Costa Rica and the area surrounding Medellin, Colombia. And so um, they basically, um, the, these Spanish explorers uh, married and had children with um, a small number of um, Amerindian uh, native women. And so it essentially created a population bottleneck. So these are highly um, genetically uh, similar populations, um, and which are highly enriched for um, genes uh, predisposing to bipolar disorder. So um, there are very large extended families that have very, very high rates of, of severe bipolar illness. Um, so we've been studying um, these populations um, in an effort to identify genes that may predispose to risk for mood disorder, and particularly uh, bipolar disorder. And so this is, uh, these are some pictures um, from the region, some really exotic uh, locations that we've, um, and th these families live in very rural areas and often the, um, the investigative teams at the universities there will have to go out to travel um, out to see them sometimes even on a horse or a donkey because um, there are no roads. So um, just to give you a sense of what these families look like um, and what we've been doing um, in these, these families, uh, this is a, a pedigree and you can see that, um, so here's grandparents. Everyone, the, the little squares and circles colored in black are people in the families with a diagnosis of bipolar one disorder, so the most severe form of bipolar illness. And you can see that, um, you know, in some of these very large families, there are multiple affected uh, siblings. And so what we've been doing is um, looking at um, neuroimaging, uh, neurocognitive, uh, as well as genetic data um, on people within these families. And so um, we found um, some interesting things so far in the adult members of these pedigrees. So um, in particular, we've found that um, gray matter thickness in the brain, so how thick your uh, cor cortex is, um, particularly in um, frontal regions like the inferior frontal gyrus, which is important for um, uh, regulation of uh, inhibitory control and being able to inhibit um, unwanted behaviors. Um, was both highly heritable, so it was under strong genetic influence, and, and also significantly associated with uh, bipolar one uh, disorder. And um, what we're doing now is we're really trying to extend uh, this work into study of adolescent members in the families. And we are also using um, this little device here called an um, Actigraph um, or an Actiwatch. And we're using these to study um, activity and circadian rhythms uh, in these families. And so this is an example here of a readout of what you get from one of these ACTA watches. 
uh, where you see the little black lines are a measure of the person's daily activity. And the, the, the yellow line is a, uh, showing light levels. And then this blue period here, you can see there's not much activity. This is the period where the person is asleep. And so from these active watches, we can get a really good readout of um, how variable the person's daily activity is, um, how stable it is, how, how sleep onset latency, so how long it takes them to fall asleep. Um, how long they, they're asleep, how disrupted their sleep is, so how many times they wake up during the night, and so forth. And so we've been um, studying this in these really large uh, families, and uh, one of the things that we've found thus far um, is that um, for adult um, individuals with bipolar 1 disorder, they tend to have later timing, um, both for their period of peak activity um, as well as their, their mid-sleep. So, so in other words, they're shifted compared to people that don't have bipolar disorder um, in terms of when their, their peak activity is. Now, um, I mentioned that we are um, starting to look at um, adolescent members of these families, and really the goal of this study is to try and understand prior to disease onset, so before people actually become ill, what are, what are some biomarkers that can help us predict who's most at risk? And um, this is, so this is just a pilot study right now um, with 17 people. So these are children of the adult uh, pedigree members. And what we found is that there's very high rates of um, psychopathology already um, in these young people. Um, their mean age is about 14. And um, over 60% um, had an anxiety disorder uh, diagnosed already. Um, also very high rates of attention deficit disorder. Um, more so, more common than mood disorder, although that was still pretty common. Um, and this is really consistent with studies in um, other high-risk populations in the United States. So um, it suggests that this is a really, you know, potentially very interesting population in which to try and understand a genetic risk because of the high degree of, of genetic um, homogeneity of the population. And so just to show you some of the, the correlations that we've found thus far, we between um, uh, some sleep and environmental variables, we found that having a greater stability of daily rhythms, so the more um, consistent your daily rhythm is, was associated with lower levels of self-reported daily stress. On the other hand, um, having greater family conflict, this was rated, uh, measured using a, something called the conflict behavior questionnaire. So greater family conflict was associated with more, uh, and this is a pretty strong relationship, between uh, higher uh, mood and anxiety symptoms. Not particularly surprising, um, and then greater family conflict was also associated with poor memory, suggesting that that's also, um, that, that greater family conflict is a, an important environmental variable. Now, of course, um, this is just our preliminary work, which is, um, uh, you know, cross-sectional. So we just attained the data at one time point. So, of course, you're probably wondering, you know, what's the direction of causality? Does the disrupted sleep cause there to be more uh, problematic family interactions and more stress or, or what comes first. And obviously we can't answer that yet. And so we're, we're um, starting now uh, embarking on a longitudinal study where we'll be able to, to look at this um, more closely. Um, but so just to give you um, an example of the way that we're thinking about this um, in terms of what is the causal pathway, we don't think that um, there's one particular gene that causes bipolar disorder. In fact, we know that there is not. But just as an example, let's say you have a mutation in a gene that's re related to circadian rhythms, causes more sleep disruption, leading to increased um, irritability and mood liability, um, potentially more hostile family interactions, thus disrupting uh, frontal limbic uh, brain circuitry, and then, of course, you have a negative uh, feedback loop here um, that going on and, and then leading to us possibly spiraling into a, a clinically significant uh, mood disorder. So this is um, the kind of gene environment interaction that we think is really relevant to the development of mood disorders in, in adolescents. And just to um, take you back again to um, some of the, the neuroimaging work, um, this was uh, a study looking at um, brain activity um, associated with risk-taking behavior and how it's um, related to sleep. So um, this was also done at UCLA, um, looking at neural activity in performance on a uh, risk-taking task. And essentially, the, the point here is that if you have um, poor sleep quality, it was associated with greater risk-taking behavior, as well as more activity in the insula, which is a brain structure related to reward, um, and, uh, and then also reduced cognitive control. So you have poor self-regulation on this task, which, so we think that um, poor sleep quality is um, 
an important factor related to, um, to some of this risk-taking behavior um, that may be a moderator. And so just to summarize, um, we know that adolescence is a period of, of brain plasticity and structural reorganization. And we think that this asynchrony and the developmental time courses between uh, frontal structures self that are regulating the brain and the subcortical structures that are very reward responsive, that this, um, uh, this asynchrony may be related to um, some of the, the difficulties um, that adolescents have with, with self-regulation uh, um, and decision making. And there's also, uh, we know, a key role of sleep in normal emotion regulation and learning and motivation. And also that sleep variability, uh, so how, how um, irregular one sleep is, is likely as important as the overall sleep duration. Um, and we know that sleep uh, disruption or um, sleep problems are a risk factor for the development of mood disorder in adolescents. And um, essentially, we think that, that um, having disrupted sleep can exaggerate our norm the normative imbalance um, between, between affective and cognitive control systems. And so the, what, we're, what we're finding in these high-risk high adolescents um, in Latin America does suggest that there are very robust links between one's daily rhythm stability and stress, as well as between um, factors like family conflict and, and between mood and cognition. So in terms of some future directions, we're obviously um, starting, uh, hoping to um, get uh, funding to do a prospective longitudinal study of these adolescent children of bipolar parents to really look at risk um, uh, trajectories over time. And so another really key question is, you know, what are the genetic and environmental risk factors for the, both the development as well as the maintenance of, of psychopathology over time? So not only um, what's related to the onset of symptoms, but what's related to symptoms getting worse, and, and importantly, what's related to symptoms getting better over time? What are some protective factors? And so, <laughs> Moving now briefly to um, lifestyle intervention. So um, there is a lot of evidence that um, there are a lot of things that can be done um, that do not involve medication um, to, uh, to basically improve self-regulation and, um, and particularly related to um, sleep. So um, in older adults with major depression, um, there's a lot of evidence for um, the effectiveness of, of alternative therapies. So yoga, Tai Chi, as well as exercise. Um, Ellen Frank um, and colleagues at Pittsburgh um, developed a social rhythm therapy um, that's been shown to be effective for adults with bipolar disorder. And, and a, a key part of this is um, this therapy is uh, regularizing uh, daily routines and, um, and also diminishing interpersonal problems and keeping our social, keeping social, uh, reg regular social activities. Um, for adolescents, uh, having a regular sleep schedule um, is really key, and this can be really difficult um, because adolescents have so many activities, um, but trying to keep, um, you know, as much as possible a regular sleep schedule um, and avoiding overscheduling is, um, can be really helpful for um, regulating mood. Also, um, limiting caffeine intake um, and nighttime screen time are also factors um, that, that can be can be helpful for um, just removing some of those distractions um, that keep people, keep us up very late at night. And I just wanna thank all of my um, colleagues and uh, who have been involved in this work and acknowledge our funding sources. And I will, oh great, it's exactly 9.45. So I will stop there for questions. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Bearden, for that presentation. Um, we do have a few questions coming in, so I will start uh -huh. with um, this first question. Have the percentages of mood disorders in teens increased over the past 20 years? Have the percentages increased over the past 20 years? That is an excellent question. It's very difficult to answer that question. <coughs> um, because the rates, the, the rates of the diagnosis of mood disorder and particularly of bipolar disorder um, in children and teens has gone up a lot. Um, however, it's really unclear how much that has to do with whether the rate is actually increasing versus how much it's getting recognized and um, how much the diagnostic boundaries have shifted. So there's both increased awareness of mood disorders. Um, there's also um, some shift in the diagnosis. So in the past, um, 20 years ago,
people really didn't believe that, um, you know, young children, particularly young children, could even have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. That shifted um, to the point where um, clinicians started thinking that every child had bipolar disorder, um, and, and many of whom probably did not, um, may have had some, you know, uh, severe temperament dysregulation. Um, at the same time, uh, th there is, uh, you know, a, a shift in terms of mental health awareness where people are getting into treatment earlier, which I think is probably a good thing. So, um, you know, are, are people suffering more from depression than they used to? I think it's actually impossible to say, um, but, but the, definitely the rate of treated um, mood disorder has gone up. Great, thank you. Next question. If I understood correctly, you're planning to look at the genetics factors such as the clock gene. Are you looking at the genetics with treatment conditions such as lithium? Genetics of, oh, of treatment response? Uh, yeah, so th that that's also, that's a very interesting issue. There was a recent study um, in, uh, in Asia that found a, a very strong relationship between a particular risk gene and a lithium response. And so that is not something we've looked at yet, but it's something we're very interested in looking at. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Uh -huh. While I had many high risks throughout development, uh, family matters, I also suffered a concussion following a motorcycle crash at age 20 in which I remained eight days in a coma. Could this have added to the fact that I was diagnosed bipolar one? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we know that, that head injury increases risk for, uh, you know, not only cognitive problems, but, but also for, for mood problems. Um, there's really no evidence right now that it should be treated uh, any differently than, um, you know, a mood disorder arising from other causes. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's uh, really absolutely important to get treatment. Thank you. Next question. Do you recommend teens without any clinical mental illness diagnosis go into psychotherapy in order to possibly catch a, any probable future diagnosis? So I, I think psychotherapy uh, is is helpful for everybody, and probably everybody has uh, you know some some problem or mild symptoms or issues that could benefit um, from talking to a therapist. So I certainly um, wouldn't advise against it if uh, if that's something that um, one that your teen is interested in. At the same time, some teens who are, um, you know, I mean, will basically feel they, they, they don't really have something to talk about. So if it's, if it's a source of tension, if you have a teen who, for example, is really resistant or not interested in going to therapy, it may not be something that they um, feel they'll benefit from at, at, at this time um, if they're not really experiencing symptoms. So it's really an individual decision, um, but, you know, my personal feeling is that it's always great to have someone uh, objective to talk to. Great, thank you. Um, if you think your teen, um, if there isn't uh, possibly an issue and you're trying to help them and they feel that it's not necessarily necessary to talk to someone and you're trying to help them get there, do you have suggestions? Do I have suggestions for how to get them to the point where they would be um, uh, open to yes. going therapy. to therapy? Yes. Right. Uh huh. Um, yeah. This is it, it's it's a bit of a challenging issue um, because obviously to to benefit from therapy you do you know kind of have to want to be there. At the same time, I think a lot of teens may feel resistant because there's some implication that, you know, if you go to therapy, it means you have a problem. And so I think talking about it from that perspective that, you know, there's, there's lots of benefits um, for therapy for people that don't have, a, you know, a psychiatric diagnosis um, 
and so it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that you know there's something seriously wrong just that it's really helpful to um, you know to work out some of your your problems by talking to somebody who's outside of the family and um, I mean that's that's one issue that that I think um, teens may be able to appreciate that sometimes, you know, you don't want to talk to your mom or your dad about, a, a, you know, a personal problem you're having and, um, you know, or, or a friend. It's, it's um, sometimes really helpful to talk to somebody that, um, you know, is completely confidential and, uh, you know, will have an, an outside perspective. Um, the other, uh, the other thing I can say is that, you know, sometimes just getting them to try it and you can just, you know, approach it not not from the perspective of this is something that you're going to have to do forever, <laughs> but, you know, just let's just try it. Um, why don't you just come and talk to this person, see how you feel and, um, you know, see what you think and, you know, whether it's helpful and, and, you know, basically with the agreement that if they feel that it's really not helpful, it's a waste of their time, it's not something they need right now. Um, as long as they agree to go into it with an open mind that, um, you know, you just agree that, that, you know, you'll, you'll respect their view of it if they really don't feel it's helpful. Excellent. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Next question. Besides sleep, sleeping affecting um, mood disorders, what are you, what is your feeling about an organic food diet? Um, that's a great question. There is very little um, empirical research on this where, um, you know, it, because really the kind of study you need is where um, people are randomized to two different conditions um, where, you know, one person has the organic diet and one person has, you know, um, something else. And it's kind of hard to, to think about exactly what the control condition would be. There's definitely evidence that, uh, you know, things like exercise, exercise for sure is helpful for mood. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that um, there's also, of course, we know that that eating a high fat diet, um, high cholesterol is, um, has, is bad for you in other ways. And so to the extent that you can feel like you're taking a positive direction on your health, I think that is, is probably a, a very helpful step. In terms of specific dietary changes, there's not a lot of evidence, but um, I would say anything that um, is a step towards a more healthy diet is, um, is, is, is recommended. Great. Um, next question. What um, is the most important advice you would give to a parent um, with adolescent experiencing mood disorders or a mood disorder? I'm sorry. The most helpful, the advice. most helpful advice for parents with an adolescent with a, yes with a mood disorder yes. So I cannot um, understate the you know I mean just just the value of treatment that involves not just the adolescent um, themselves but really the whole family um, as much as possible. So there's um, evidence that uh, family focused therapy in particular um, is is really effective. So this is a therapy that involves um, which is developed by my colleague David Miklowitz at UCLA. So this therapy. Um, really involves um, improving family communication, and that's really believed to be a very important component of improving coping skills um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, reducing negative affect and hostility in the family environment. So um, that's something, that's a specific treatment that I would, I would highly recommend. Um, and then, you know, from a, from a more general perspective, I think just having a very... Um, a very open dialogue and, uh, you know, and, and really, a, you know, a good, um, having a good understanding relationship of, of what all the issues are um, is really, is really important. But I think, I think that treatment really should be something that involves the whole family and it's not, um, you know, not viewed as this is, you know, your disease or your, your problem, um, I think is really an important way to conceptualize it. Great. Thank you, Carrie. I think that is all the questions we have this morning. Um, I really appreciate all the information that you've shared with us. I do want to remind everyone that um, this webinar is has been recorded and it will be uploaded to our website this afternoon for future viewing. 
Um, and again, thank you so much for joining us, Carrie. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, thank you all for joining. And um, yeah, please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions later on. Um, you can find me um, via email at UCLA. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. My pleasure. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye.